Have you ever been cleaning out your house or your office and found cool stuff you didn't know you had? Yeah, that just happened to me. I'm still, uh, I'm still in the process of a move. Have you ever had a move that just never ended? Yeah, that's what I'm in. I'm mostly having a good time, though. Uh, sure is great to be back. Uh, I hardly knew what to do with myself uh, last Sunday, not giving a me- message. I practically went up on the cruise ship and just started talking to people during breakfast. I could hardly help myself not talking on a Sunday morning. Anyway, it is great to be back. I'm happy to be still in the book, The Fifth Agreement. It was one of the books I took with me. Uh, this book that we've been studying is a book for living, right? It's not just a book that... Oh, well, maybe we read it for fun and put it down. Although, I I want you to know I have a summer goal. I'm almost there. My goal is to read 10 books this summer, and I'm on seven right now. Uh, I'm so happy about that, and they've been fun books. You know how fun it is just to read a novel that has to do with nothing, you know? That's just... And then then I've been in this process of reading, and, you know, somebody gave me a book, and then I was interested in this other book, and I grabbed it. Two of my books intersected in an unbelievable way. It was... Like some random, bizarre story about the Cheyenne Indians in the late 1800s. And two different books I was reading talked about the same event. So I'm saying, okay, what am I supposed to understand and write, get about this? Am I supposed to study more? Amazing how spirit works. Amen? How it's conspiring to bring us our good. Did you know that? Like the universe is literally conspiring to bring you your good. And I'm telling you, there are days it does not look like that. Amen? Ugh. It's like, what is this? You know? All right, so we're in... Um, does anybody know what chapter we're on in the book? We're on chapter what? On chapter 10. We're on chapter 10, and it's, the subtitle of this chapter is The Warriors. We are all, in this room, spiritual warriors. Will you say with me, I am a spiritual warrior, together? I am a spiritual warrior. Now, when we say that, we don't want to say it like, I am a spiritual warrior. We want, to be, uh, we want to be full of, uh, full of our masculinity at that point. You know what I'm saying? I mean, like, so let's try again. And when you say it, I want you to think about really being a spiritual warrior together. I am a spiritual warrior. You see how much stronger that felt? Do you see how much our words uh, create our reality and how much our attention creates our reality? When I had you put your hand over your heart, it was related to the message. And when I saw Marshall doing it, I was like, oh, thank you. That's right. He does that every Sunday. And one of the things this reading is about right now is about your attention. Where is your attention? And attention is a holy thing. So one of the things we learned from the book is how, you know, when we're growing up, what what the Toltecs call... All that we're learning as we're growing and developing is the first attention. The first attention, and I I haven't used those words yet because it hasn't been important until just now. Even though it's been throughout the book and many people have been reading the book, I know. But the first attention is where we learn everything. In other words, we pile on the knowledge. That's the first attention. The second attention is when we learn to doubt everything we learned. The second attention, if you're in this room, that's what you're in. The first attention would have you in a different kind of church following a different kind of minister. The first attention is believe what you're told and nothing else. Don't think for yourself. Believe these rules and if you do these things, God will save you. That's the first attention. That's the first rule we learn. Somebody out here is going to do it for us. And we learn, you know, Jesus Christ died on the cross to save you from your sins. Well, if I walked out on that road right now and there were cars whizzing by and I didn't look both ways, would I still be killed if I decided to walk? Yeah. Could Jesus save me from that? But does it happen every day that he doesn't? I mean, he could, obviously, right? He could. But why doesn't it happen? There are certain laws in place. There are certain understandings in place. There are responsibilities in place. Like Jesus said, hey, I'm going to go do this. I'm going to give you a few tools. Here's what you do. You love one another. Oh, wait. You forgive one another. 
These are the tools. I'm giving you all the tools. If he were doing it for us, why would he have given us the tools? Don't worry, I got you. If you need anything, I'm going to swoop down and rescue you. No, that's not what happens. Now, is gra do we have grace? Does God help us? Of course. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying, if you're on a 30-foot building and you walk off it, the law of gravity is in effect. There is a law there. Right? You are the responsible one to not walk off the roof. Your life is in your hands. And then, of course, yes, do we, do we ask for God's guidance, ask for God's wisdom? Yes. Then it's ours to act on it. Right? That's the second attention is, it's up to you. See, we've been told all along somebody else is going to do it. We're told it by uh, many leaders in our community that they're, they're going to take care of it for us. Don't worry. But I'm saying, and this book is saying, and it's a very indigenous teaching, by the way, it's up to you to decide. The Buddha, the Christ, is not going to do it for you. You must do it for yourself. And the wisdom from these masters is yours for the taking. Right? So, yes, the wisdom is there, the love is there, the forgiveness is there, the help and support is there. But the activity of that spirit is up to you. Right? We demonstrate the teaching of the masters, not wait on them to do it for us. You see the difference in the consciousness of that? The difference is we move forward as is ours to do. That's the second attention is we unlearn everything we've learned. I mean, this is, a, this is really a radical teaching because it's the opposite of what most everything says, right? It's, it's very much about coming back to what? To live from your authentic self, your real self, which at the core is love. Now, I want to share a quote with you, and it's from the Gospel of Thomas. The Gospel of Thomas is not in the canonized Bible that we read. The Gospel of Thomas was one of the texts found much, you know, in the 1900s that is um, it's part of a collection of works, uh, of holy books, and it's beautiful. It's the most beautiful Jesus teachings I've ever seen because all they are is quotes. And what I love about the Gospel of Thomas, it takes out all the other information around it and it's just the quotes of the things that Jesus said. And here's one of them. It says this, If you bring forth that which is within you, that which you bring forth will save you. If you do not bring forth that which is within you, that which is within you will destroy you. Now, that is a wisdom teaching. That is a true wisdom teaching. What is that teaching really saying to us? What's that teaching really saying? In other words, all the goodness, all the love, all the peace, all the joy that you've ever wanted is right here within you. But we don't know it because we have lost our ability to be aware of it. So awareness is the key in learning, relearning who we are. So as we begin to doubt everything, and you know, it's so important to remember. You remember in that story of Adam and Eve in the book of Genesis? What brought them into what is known as the fall is doubting they were equal with God. And one doubt led to another, led to another, led to another. And pretty soon, all we believe is the doubts and the lies about who we are. As a culture, that's still where we are, by and large. But now more and more people are waking up to what he's calling in here the second attention, which is waking up to the fact that God is here present in each one of us. So here's the deal. Doubt, open the door to hell, and it can open the door to heaven the same way. Right? So doubt is the one... Doubt is the one that caused the fall. Wasn't Eve. It wasn't no apple. By the way, the Bible never says apple. You need to read that story again. Yeah, so... And by the way, there's two creation stories in early Genesis. Boy, we could go on with that for a long time. So it's doubt that kind of starts almost a possession, doubting our real selves. Doubt also unlocks the possession of your real self. It's amazing. Doubt is the key. Doubt is the key. Doubt is the key that unlocks the door to your soul. In other words, you're going to quit believing the lies that have been told about you 
and start believing the truth about you. It's amazing to, to say to yourself, I'm going to quit believing my own story. And I'm telling you, I cannot tell you the number of times in the last couple months I have gotten to unlearn a story about myself and about somebody else. What a gift to me and to my soul. What a gift. And then I realize the only forgiveness I need to offer is of myself because any unforgiveness I hold of anybody else is a story I've made up. Now, here's what I mean. Here's what I mean. So we can say, all right, well, when I was five or when I was seven or when I was nine, this happened. I understand. Everybody in this room has a story, some of them horrific. I understand that. Having said that, that was then. And we care, most of us carry our history around like, like we never, ever put it down. And it's like we're carrying a corpse around. And every time we get around people we love, we bring out this corpse and it stinks. And it's hard to, it's heavy. And it's hard to move it aside when we're trying to uh, be in loving relationship with someone. And there's a stinking thing in the middle of the room. And we're wondering why the relationship isn't working. And it's because you have a stinking corpse in the middle of the, the room with you. Right? So the past doesn't have to dictate our now moment. The past is the past and was over in the past. You know, it's like, I think about most of psychology is based on the healing of traumas that happened 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago. And why? Because we keep carrying them into the present moment as if they're still happening. And by the way, that's an important process to be in. That's an important process to be in of healing the past. But one of the ways we do it is to remind ourselves, the past is not happening now. I'm in the present moment. What happened in the past is not happening now. Especially if our reaction to something is huge. Boy, that's a real good clue. It's archaic. That's the word I use. If I'm, you know, you've heard people say, I got triggered. Well, then do something about that. Instead of walking around some big trigger. Everybody, do you expect everybody to work around all your triggers? We don't even know where they are. We're supposed to work around them. Oh, you pr- push my button. Well, where is the button? My God, what's the button? Can you just remove the button? Right. I mean, like, what? Right. Don't we say that? I was triggered. So you were triggered. So you decided to take out everyone around you? Well, Yeah. We still see, we still believe in human sacrifice, don't we? <laughs> we'll take out somebody. Oh, boy, it's easy to do, too. Especially when they're so obviously wrong, you know what I'm saying? Right, so that's, that's what I'm talking about. You see how the past is dictating the present, and the present doesn't even have to do with it? I've been in ministry long enough to understand when I see that story going on in front of me. And it's, it's at both times heartbreaking and compassionate bringing for me because I can see the person stuck in the past relating it to me or someone else like it is God's honest truth of what's happening somebody who betrayed them who was in leadership or somebody who right and then it's all on whoever's nearby even if it's not even close to the truth there's story there's evidence And there's the former wound that's been brought right, the corpse that's been brought right in. The idea of the corpse is, I'm telling you, that's exactly what it's like. And then the people we love the most are the ones that get the most of it, right? They get all the stinkiness. Because we're not on good behavior because we know they love us. So, you know, we let down our guard and we are who we really are. And, oh boy, right? We find out some of that. Maybe that's why it's called stinking thinking. You know what I'm saying? Right? Because it's old thinking that's related to the past. So when you begin to doubt yourself, what you are, you're doubting. You're not doubting. I'm saying things happen. I I could give you a story too that make y'all cry about my childhood. But you know what? I'm not that story anymore. I'm not that kid anymore. It's over. It's over. I've grown up. I've grown up in the best possible way I've grown up, right? So I take the lessons from the past into my present, but the past doesn't run my life anymore, right? Sure, I have things come up, don't we all? But then we deal with what comes up. 
We are spiritual warriors. How does a warrior handle things? With great courage. A warrior handles things with great fierceness. Huh? Great strength, yes. So when an old issue comes up, something that's you know, bothering us that tends to be a pattern, and it's, it's really obvious, we really know what those things are, right? Then we say, okay, hmm, I wonder if I need to doubt my story about this. And then as we doubt the story, what happens is something starts relaxing around the story. And things that we thought were true, we say, you know, that actually might not be true after all. And then we start checking them out both with ourselves and then maybe with the people we love. And we find out, oh, these stories, boy, these aren't close to true. This story I've made up is literally of my own making. I have made myself a dream of hell that I seem to enjoy living in. The dream of hell is the same as the dream of heaven. The only difference is you choose which one you want to create. It's true. And I will tell you, I have literally worked with people where I have said to them, do you want to heal? And they say to me, no. It's happened. And that's the point in my office where... I say, okay... When you're ready, let me know. Spirit has eternity. I've got as long as I've got. When you're ready, let's heal. When you're ready, I'll be here. So the dream of heaven or the dream of hell is up to you. As my friend from Cuba always says to me, it's up to you. <laughs> He's so dear to me. That's what he says. Alice, it's up to you. He's taught me so much about the Bible. It's up to you. That's, the be that's one of the greatest spiritual teachings we have. It's up to you. Right? It's up to you. Great spiritual teaching. So one of the ways we get free from the past. Forgiveness. What are we forgiving when we forgive? Forgiveness is a letting go of a toxic energy. It's not excusing bad behaviors. Forgiveness is something you do for yourself even when it feels like you're doing it for the other person. You know what? Karma takes care of the other person. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> Don't worry. Scriptures say, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. It is done unto you, right? For, and the scriptures say, Forgive and you will be what? Mm -hmm. Yeah, forgive, forgive, forgive for everything, everyone. Sometimes in my prayers, I say I forgive every, everyone for everything, including myself. I have to say that because I always leave myself out of the equation. Do you guys do that? For, and really, any unforgiveness we have toward others is unforgiveness we have toward ourselves. And if you don't believe me, try it. Try it. This will bring a new energy. This will bring a new peace. That's why we do it. You get to have this, but you got to forgive first. You don't get this by reading self-help books. All those self-help books are wonderful. I got as much peace reading a novel as I did a self-help book this, uh, this vacation. Dennis and I were talking about that earlier, how, uh, how for years we just read self-help, right? And then the first time we read a novel, it was like, oh, yeah, this, there's a lot of truth here too, right? So this is what we want, right? No, no, doesn't, and we say, why doesn't the world have peace? We don't have peace in our own minds, that's why. You know, and it's amazing what people think they're fighting for out there. And I tell you, I, I so um, honor our soldiers, as you all know. They don't even know what they're fighting for half the time. How about kids in our inner city gangs? What are they fighting for? Something they think they believe in? A story they've told about what belongs to them and not somebody else? Just because they've said? Does that sound like a war going on in the Middle East? Exactly. It's all the same, it's all the same war. So when we become spiritual warriors, the war isn't out here. It's in the mind. But if it's not dealt with in the mind, it comes out here. All these shootings we see, 
The inside war has come out because it has not been dealt with. Just this week, I got a letter from my alma mater where I went to college. In uh, It was uh, Seattle Pacific, and so it was a small liberal arts college in Seattle. There was a shooting on the campus. I couldn't believe it for the safety I felt when I was there. I couldn't believe it. That was as close to me personally as one of those shootings had gotten, and I was imagining the campus and the professors and the students and what that must have been like. See, that's when the war inside the mind is not dealt with and it starts to get, and it's so projected out into the world, that's all this is seen as, is a war zone. Right? That's why the world is how it is, because nobody's operating from the authentic self. That's why I want, I'll tell you, I want our pews to be full every service, every Sunday. My goal is by Sunday, November 2nd, which is our 75th anniversary, to have 750 people here that day. And I'm going to have three services. I want you to hold that in consciousness with me. 750 for the 75th. Right? We can do that. If everybody invited one person, we'd do it. We'd more than do it. We'd, we'd get, have 800 or more if everybody just invited one person between now and then. I know it. Because this is the message people need to hear, and they know it. From any religion, any denomination, to know that they are a soul and that there's an authentic self that they have not, don't even know is there and it's waiting on them to notice it, to make their life better, better, full of more joy, more love, more peace. Who wouldn't want that? I'm, you can keep attending Mass. You can keep going to your Buddhist meditation. But don't forget that you're a soul. Don't forget that you're a soul. Don't forget that there's an authentic self right there waiting for you to notice it. Give it your attention. So as we become spiritual warriors, what we're saying is the war is within our own mind. In other words, within our own soul. It's not out here where we're making it. See, this is how the psyche, by the way, psyche means soul. And I love that. Psychology really is the study of the soul. Right, so as we are doing this work, as we are remembering we are a soul... More and more, instead of the war being out here, instead of trying to make the war out here, we start getting nice reflections because we're putting our attention on what's happening. We say, oh, you know what? That's not them, actually. That's me. And so we start learning to check out our story, see? All the war that seems to be going on out here is actually within ourselves. It's a story we've made up. Now, as we begin to do the work more and more, you start to see things as they really are. You start to see things as they're really happening. And what happens is, rather than have to doubt everything, you start to get to believe yourself again. But you're believing yourself from your authentic self. I feel like I have to say that because some people are saying, oh, I'm not going to forget everything I know because what am I going to do? Walk around being some spiritual weirdo, you know? No. Actually, you get to be... <laughs> A lot cooler, you know. A lot more sexy. Yeah, that's what sells these days. A lot more attractive. Do you realize how unattractive hate is? Very unattractive. So what we're learning to do is move back to remembering, operating from the soul level. Right? In the book, he calls it authentic self. Same thing, same thing, right? So we begin to live from our authentic self, not from the story we've told. Forgiveness is a really important tool to living from your authentic self. If you knew how good forgiveness was, did, did you guys ever see that movie? Um, it was actually a series. It was a crazy uh, series called Lost. Did anybody watch the whole thing besides me? Okay. The very end, does anybody remember the key to the very end? It was forgiveness. The very key to that whole bizarre show was forgiveness. Because where were the, where were the people in the, in the story lost? Anybody remember? They had this plane crash and then they were, basically, you know what they were doing? They were doing their soul work trying to what? Trying to cross over. But they couldn't cross over until they had done what?
So they were getting sole opportunity after sole opportunity in this in-between place to work out their karma. This was the key. This was the key to move their soul to its next incarnation. It was really beautiful. Crazy series, but really beautiful. Many of you know that I was... Um, yeah, I shared with you a while back about um, my reading that I do every day, and I was saying, I couldn't believe it again this morning. Remember two Sundays ago? The reading was exactly on the topic. It happened again. I said, I got to tell him. Sitting in my... and Oh, and by the way, since I last told you, my meditation space is so great now. I think last time I told you I was meditating by piles of coat hangers and things like that. Well, this is, was a pristine altar with one candle this morning with you, you on my mind. So, very early. Here's what it says. Everything needs attention. We need attention. We need a touch of the divine, a, reassur a reassurance that we are children tenderly revered. Our needs are met and our love and compassion are turned outward to care about things and people around us. Giving attention is a sacred promise, a word spoken to us, for us, and by us. The word creates and brings out the invisible everything that operates a world of activity. Nothing can stop it but our denial. This makes saying something very important, important that we speak right, not only to cause right conditions, but to remain children tenderly cherished. Words are life and death. Choose life. Beautiful, right? There's an old Cherokee teaching that says, and, and I'll tell you, the, the, the way I learned it was um, there was a grandma talking to her, to her grandkids. And she was saying, oh, you know, the kids were fighting. And uh, she says, oh, you know, I need to tell you a story. And the kids go, because when grandma told stories, kids knew to listen, right? She said, I don't know if you all heard the one about the, uh, the Indian that has this, uh, these two wolves living inside of him. The kids said, no, no. Well, what do you mean two wolves living inside? Yeah, you see those wolves, they fight all the time, you see. And they said, well, what, what, are, the, what are the wolves? Well, what do you mean? What are the wolves? How, why are they fighting? Ah, she says, well, one's good and one's evil. And they said, which one wins? Ah, that's easy. It's the one you feed. Yeah. In cartoons, we see it as the angel and the devil, don't we? Yeah, so... We want to move into operating from our soul. We want to move into a place of living from love. And I'm talking about real love. Not the love that tries to possess. Not the love that tries to control. Not the love that tries to hurt. To get its way. That's not love. We know that's not love. At our depth, we know that's not love. It's real love. The authentic love that we know we are made of. 